Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Mesa Air Group stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Mesa Air Group is a commercial aviation holding company with headquarters in Phoenix, Arizona. The company operates one regional airline subsidiary, Mesa Airlines. Mesa Airlines operates as American Eagle and United Express under contractual agreements with American Airlines and United Airlines. It operates 145 aircraft with more than 610 daily departures to 110 cities throughout the U.S., Canada, Mexico, the Bahamas, and Cuba. In 2010, the company filed bankruptcy, hoping to get rid of the leases on the planes it wasn't using anymore. It did re-emerge from bankruptcy the following year in 2011 as a privately held company. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 434 million market cap. They're trading at $12 a share and they have 36 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So the company does have positive and growing free cash flow each year. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. Their net income is pretty consistent each year between 27 and $48 million. Revenue is a sales for the company and that peaked in 2019 at 723 million. Then it's been dropping since then, mainly due to COVID and low air travel. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. An example is cost of labor. The difference between those two numbers is their gross profit. Their gross profit is positive, but it's a lot lower than it was in 2018 and 19. Below that is their operating expenses. Examples are insurance and depreciation. Then below that is operating income. So the company does have positive operating income each year. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt. Then there's other income and expenses. This is usually impairments or other non-operational gains and losses. Then you have your pre-tax income, then your taxes. So it is good the company does have positive net income each year. And the reason their net income is pretty similar to 2018 and 19 is because in 2018 and 19, they had a big negative in other income and expenses that brought down their net income. I would focus on operating income when looking at a company. That's a better indicator of how a company's doing. The stuff below operating income is not part of their main business. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. Then you have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. So the company does have a lot of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, mainly due to low CapEx. They had over 100 million of CapEx in 2018 and 19, and it's down to 16 million in the trailing 12 months. In 2018, the company had very little free cash flow, and it looks like it had to pay back over $200 million of debt. So it appears they issued 124 million of capital stock to help run the business. The company didn't issue any more capital stock after 2018, and it looks like they're paying down more debt than they're issuing each year. So it looks like they're trying to really tighten their business and become more efficient and profitable. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. If you cannot generate positive operating cash flow, you don't have much of a business. And they do generate a good amount of operating cash flow between 120 and 220 million dollars a year. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, 
and then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. They had an $82 million depreciation expense. That brings down their net income, but it's a non-cash item, so we add it back here. They had $11 million in deferred taxes, $4 million in stock-based compensation, and $73 million in changes in working capital. Even though the company reported a $31 million profit, they actually generated $215 million of cash flow. Let's look at their capital structure. Half a billion of equity, $800 million of debt. They're 37% equity, 63% debt. So they're a bit leveraged. Their net debt is $640 million, and their WAC is 11.5%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for that $731 million. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $694 million. We divide that by 36 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $19. They're trading at $12, so they're trading at a 38% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply, Wall Street values the company at 128, so they're saying it's a really strong buy. That's a really high stock price. So if they're right and you own this stock, you're going to make a lot of money. This is the stock price the last three years. So it looks like it's been pretty steady. It did drop a lot at one point. The stock price has pretty much come up to where it was when it first started trading. This company has a really high beta, 3.12, so the stock moves more than three times the market. The 52-week change was up 29% compared to the S&P 500, which is up 17%. The 52-week low was $2, the high was 13 and the stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. About 1 to 2 million shares are traded each day on this stock, and of the 36 million shares outstanding, 25 million are on float, 75% are held by institutions, and about 4.5% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 when this stock IPO'd in 2018, you would have been down a lot at one point, but if you held on, you would have been back to where you started. Ron Burkle is the biggest shareholder, then Core Partners, then UBS, then MSD, then BlackRock. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average P.E. in the market is 9, the median is 14. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 13.9, so investors are paying $14 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. They have a really good price to sales ratio. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They also have a really good price to book ratio. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet, and they have 484 million of equity, 477 million of tangible equity, since they have 8 million of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. They can cover their interest payments two times. ROE is net income over equity. They have a 6% ROE. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They can cover 80% of their current liabilities with their current assets. And their current assets are mainly cash of $181 million. The company does seem to be well capitalized. They had $200 million of free cash flow and negative $52 million of working capital. Plus, they don't pay a dividend. So they have $148 million of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on 12 airlines. Mesa is right here. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they're better in all the price multiples, which is great. They do have a worse than average current ratio, but it's pretty close to average. They have positive ROE. The average is negative. They are higher in debt than the average. And they're by far the smallest company of this group, under a half a billion market cap. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 38% discount. And this company has been around since 1980, so they do have a good place in the market. They are a regional carrier. They're not a major airline. So it is possible a major airline will acquire them. But if that happens and you own the stock, you won't lose out. You'll still get paid whatever the stock is worth, probably more or you just may get stock of the new airline. But airlines are one of those industries that we need as a society to function. 
So they're not going away. There is a risk that some airlines may go away, but not the entire airline industry. That's here to stay. I rank their free cash flow 7 out of 10 because they're growing them really nicely. I rank their revenue 5 out of 10. It did peak in 2019 and dropped a lot, but every airline has dropped a lot in 2020. And not just airlines, most businesses dropped a lot in 2020. And I give their ratios 5 out of 10. They do have good price multiples, but they have a pretty weak current ratio, a fairly low ROE, and they do have a lot of debt. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.